again. Hi. Uh, welcome to the October Drupal New York City meetup. I'm Joe Bachana, and this is Holin Kuhn. And because Alex uh, is not here this month, we needed two people to do the, uh, the job of, uh, of Alex. We're sitting in those, pretty large shoes. Those are really, really huge shoes. <laughs> so let's, uh, we can advance this. We'll kind of tell you what our, uh, our format is. First, housekeeping. Uh, obviously, mute your devices. Um, if you want to ask a question, there's going to be a mic somewhere. I think Chris in the back will have it. So please speak into it. This, uh, all presentations will be recorded, so you can access them later. Restrooms, the women's room is in the middle of the stage left hallway. The whichever is middle of stage right hallway, and the men's is the middle of stage right hallway as well. So down that way, if you're not sure which is stage right, stage left. One more thing, if you need Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi information is at the bottom of each slide. So this is our agenda. Right now we're doing announcements. We're going to start talk as soon as we finish the announcements. And the closing remarks about 835, and we have an after party sponsored by Fastly, and it's going to be at Bill's Bar and Burger. So thank you, Fastly. Okay, and so here are our presentations for the night. We're first going to have one uh, by Gergely uh, Zanka on working through the Drupal issue queue, a beginner's primer to reviewing patches. Where's Gergely? There. Uh, DrupalCon Vienna summary by Hong Ling. She was there. Lucky stiff. <laughs> I'm going to do one on key characteristics of digital asset management. And then we've got coming in from Philly, the Philly area from Message Agency, Aaron Bauman is here to present on how to use the Salesforce suite with Drupal 8, which is newly released. So that's our uh, lineup for the day. These are our organizers. And uh, if anybody, uh, can you guys raise your hands who are any of the organizers here? Chris in the back. Very gay. A lot of folks are uh, kind of uh, on the road this week. But, so we'll hopefully get them back uh, next month. So our food and drinks, the pizza is sponsored by our host, NBC Universal. So let's give it up for them. <laughs> and of course, our after party is sponsored by Fastly. So we'll see them over there at the end of this event. Um, if you would like to take any photos, we would love for you to uh, post them up on Twitter or Instagram or any other place you want. We now have a Facebook page for Drupal New York City or NYC page, so feel free to post and, uh, and share there as well. So we have some upcoming events. We've got bad, anybody going to Bad Camp? Neil? Okay. Anybody going to Cornell Drupal Camp? Cool. Nice. And we've got the New, Engl New England uh, Drupal Camp. I feel like they should fit an R in between the E and the D somewhere. They may get better attendance. They did uh, New, Eng New England Radical Drupal Camp. <laughs> so, and here to uh, speak with us about uh, open camps is Willie Karam. Hey, thanks, Joe. And thanks to all the organizers for the work they put into the meetup. I uh, really appreciate it. I just want to mention quickly that we have open camps coming up. Uh, next month, so uh, the third week of November. Um, so it's a larger open source conference that we've been going over the years in New York City. Um, covers a bunch of different technologies, and we have um, a Drupal camp that we run there that spans a couple days and has um, sort of a mix of Drupal content. Um, so it's a good, fun event. Um, if anyone wants to get involved in volunteering, um, you know, or speaking or sponsoring, they could drop us an email um, at that email address, info at NYC camp. Um, and Tim, who's not here, Tim Hobart is working on the website. If you want to get involved, um, you could offer to help them with that as well. So, um, and if anyone has any questions, I can answer questions too. Um, so I think we're this year is probably going to be a bit smaller than last year, but it'll still be a good size event. Um, we're about 50% of the way towards our fundraising target, and we have a midtown venue lined up, and we're we've been trying to raise enough money to host at the Javits. So. Um, we can potentially do that this year if we raise enough. So if you have any sponsors, that would be great. And then um, if not this year, then hopefully we'll end up with 
next year. So I'll be around for a bit if anyone has any questions. So thanks, and thanks to Fastly and NBC for hosting. Now, so if you'd like to speak at a, how many of you are new to Drupal? Can I just see a quick show of hands? Who's here for the first time? Well, first of all, let's welcome you guys. <laughs> Learn well, there's plenty of resources. You can grab one of us around the room and we'll be more than happy to you know, point you to links on the internet or great, great resources to get yourselves up, up to speed. But for those of you who've been working with Drupal for a while, we really could use your presentations. The community, it's great for you. It's gonna help you become a, a more comfortable presenter, which is important for all of us in our careers. And it's really great for the community. It's a good karma thing to do, to present on anything from your favorite module to you know, how you use Docker or just about any kind of a, a subject that's Drupal related. We also ask for in-depth talks, which are usually about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and so if you would like to present, uh, or if you have a, an idea for a presentation that maybe you want to suggest somebody else to make, then just uh, go to that uh, link and, uh, and present it to us. So um, who here is hiring? Raise your hand. Who here is looking? Cool. Uh, I, my understanding is that um, this venue, MBCU, is always hiring. I don't, um, for details, probably talk to an MBC engineer. Um, I think this month, then we, we can go ahead. Um, let's talk at the after party. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and you know, we have a custom in our meetups to just take five minutes to introduce yourself to someone you don't know. I have a feeling you guys know each other. You look like you're uh, buddies. So try and introduce yourself to somebody you do not know in the room, and just let's chat for a few minutes. And we can start now.
All right. Uh, it's more than five minutes. And any, I, I know this is like the awkward moment. You're like in the middle of a sentence. But whatever you guys want to talk about, we have the after party. Let's talk about beers. Anyway, beers. So our um, first presenter tonight uh, is uh, Gagare Zonka. Sorry, I know him so well, but we're, we're on first name basis. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry. Gagare started his career as a full-time PHP developer in 2002. Four years and far too many lines of custom code. Later, he finally realized that using a CMS isn't only for losers after all and evaluated a few solutions. He chose the new and shiny Drupal 4.7 purely for technical reasons, but after getting involved with the community, he knew he had truly made the best possible choice. In 2012, Gaguerre co-founded Cheppers, the company that has become one of the leading Drupal shops in Central Europe, and he recently moved to New York City to build a branch in the USA. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gaguerre, uh, presenting working through the Drupal issue queue, a beginner's primer to reviewing patches. Hello, so my name is Gergely Chonka, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, working through the Drupal issue queue uh, and uh, beginners primer to reviewing patches. So uh, a few of you, I, I think were here uh, last month, I, I told about um, contributing to Drupal and the many ways, and I, I had the feeling afterwards that just talking about, uh, like, telling you about at least 15 different ways to, to contribute to Drupal, but not really going into uh, the details, probably I didn't make uh, make it, any of those uh, attractive. So I'm sorry about that, and, but this this time I'm going to go very uh, very deeply into the details of, of one of the, the ways to contribute. So next month you're not going to have any uh, any excuses for not, not uh, contributing to Drupal. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to talk about reviewing patches and, and uh, reviewing code that, that other people write for Drupal. Uh, and the first question is why, why would anyone do that? Why would you review code? Uh, why would you review patches? And uh, so the answer is that actually all the code that is written by, uh, by volunteers to Drupal, all, the, all that code has to go through a review uh, before it gets merged into the code base of Drupal. So it doesn't matter how, how many lines of code uh, gets written by, by people, Drupal will not uh, see any of those changes until someone reviews them. And uh, so actually reviewing code is just as important as writing the code in the first place. So, um, and there's another reason. Actually you can, you, you get, um, because it's so important, you also get uh, how do you call it uh, the, the issue, um, the commit mention. So you get some. I don't know. This is a Drupal equivalent of internet money. So you get some fame or some recognition for for doing reviews. Uh, yeah. So this is something that that is a way to to um, make make your Drupal rep yep, reputation better. Okay. What what to review? So, how do you find an issue that you can review? This is actually—I uh, have to admit that this is this is not easy, and this is most of the time this is where people just quit or give up. So, let me let me tell you how how you can find an, an, an issue that you can review. Actually, the the easiest way is to go to a Drupal event when there is a, a code sprint, one of the the conferences like the Drupal cons. 
they will always have sprints for the whole uh, length of the, the conference. So whenever you feel like it, you can just walk into the sprint room, find a mentor, they will tell you how, what to do, how to do it. They will uh, help you get started. And there are some, some dedicated events just for code, coding. So you can go to, uh, there is the, the Drupal Dev Days. Most of, well, in the past, it's, uh, the, these events has, have always been in, in Europe, but maybe in the future, someone will organize one of these uh, Dev Days in the US. And on the other hand, there are also the, the global sprint weekends. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, but this is something that uh, I don't actually don't even know who came up with this idea. But uh, the whole world on the same weekend, everyone is is uh, coding and, and and improving Drupal the best they can. Actually, um, my com company several times has organized. Uh, uh, so we provided a, a, a sprint room so people could come to our offices and, and work together. Uh, we had mentors. Um, Deborah Hoichi was usually the, um, the one who, who helped uh, other people get started. So if you go to one of these events, that's, that's the best. I, I, that's the way I started. That's the way most of the people I know started. But if you, if, if you are not able to go to one of these events or you're, you just don't want to wait until the next one, you can go on Slack, and actually, you can. Um, I know that it's very small, but you know Slack. So anyway, there's a Drupal Slack. You can go go on the Drupal Slack and go to the one of the the, the uh, channels where people are con uh, the contributors are hanging out, and you can ask them to to give uh, you an issue that it, that that they uh, you could work on, uh, some something that you could re review. And probably you will get a lot of help from them. But even, even if that's not the case, even if you're on your own, let me show you how you can. Um, let me show you how you can find, let me show you how you can find an issue for yourself. Uh, so if you go to drupal.org, uh, you can click on support and then here is the core issue queue. It's not that easy to find this link. I, uh, yeah, it, yeah, whatever. So you want, but now I'm I just showed you. So next time you will find it. And so these are the issues for Drupal core. This is, this is actually. I mean, if you're uh, familiar with with uh, software development, then you, I'm sure that you're familiar with with issue tracking tools, just like Jira or Redmine. So this is similar to that. You have the issues here. The difference, of course, is is everything is it, all the work is done by volunteers. So, yeah, nobody, uh, almost nobody is is getting paid for for working on Drupal. And yeah, and so uh, the way to find find an issue for you, uh, if you want some uh, to add some keywords, you can do it here. I, we're not going to do that right now. Status. This is important. Uh, I guess it's very, uh, really, yeah, better, right? Okay, uh, so the status. Uh, anyway, uh, we are we are going uh, we are going to review patches. So we we are looking for uh, issues with the status needs review. Uh, priority. It doesn't really matter uh, unless you you know really want to be the big hero who fixes something critical, but doesn't really matter, uh, at least not now. Category, uh, well, if you're just starting, I, I, uh, I uh, recommend uh, searching for uh, or filtering for bug reports because a bug report means that it's, there's the functionality is there, everything, it has tests or whatever, everything is there, it just doesn't exactly work as expected, but it's very easy to, to, to to see if, if it's fixed or not. So it, these are the easiest to review. Uh, on, on the other hand, for example, if you, if you decide to, to um, review a feature request, that's a lot more, more difficult because then there, there, there's a lot more to, to, to review. Version, you can, so you can filter by Drupal version here, but actually I don't, we're not going to do that right now because um, all the active issues are for Drupal 8, uh, and 
and all the active issues, it doesn't matter if they, for, let's, for example, this one is for uh, 8.4.x, for the development uh, branch, but uh, 8.4 was released just today, so we, actually the, the, the time it gets into core, it will be 8.5 at, at least, or even more, so it doesn't matter. Uh, Okay, and uh, so here are, here are the, the issues that we have. And uh, the thing is that I just showed you how to find uh, issues that, that you, could, you could review. So these are all issues that, uh, oh, actually I didn't search for this. Okay, now we are, I'm going to, here we have the, the, the list. So these are the things that we could start reviewing right away. Unfortunately, before I, uh, so, my, most of my afternoon, I, 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 I was trying to find an issue that is easy enough and, and in, like, so I couldn't come up with one, so I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh, but, um, and, and actually show you how I reviewed one of, one, of the, the, uh, one of the issues in the past. That issue is fixed by now, so unfortunately we're not going to actually live review something and, and uh, submit our review right now. Uh, but this is actually, I mean, this is fun. I, I really recommend uh, doing it. So, yeah, let me show you how I did it. And then when you go home, you can do the same. Or, well, not the same. Do, choose another issue. But, um, so this one was, um, this is the issue. Um, uh, you can see um, right now on, on, uh, on the drupal.org issue queue, uh, issues have um, like a template. When you, when you create a new issue, uh, these are the, the usual uh, sections of the, of the, um, of, of the uh, issue description. You start with a problem or slash motivation and so whatever. Uh, and so this one, I don't want to, to spend too much time on, on you know, reading everything out for you, but uh, the issue was that it, when you select a, a, a time zone, it's just too, too hard to find uh, uh, your, your own time zone. There are, all of them are, are prefixed with, with the, the region and whatever. So it, wasn't, it didn't uh, look that nice. And then, so, uh, this was the, this, the, the suggestion in this issue. So let's, let's change the, the, the list and have it like uh, headers and, and actual mm, options in the, in, in the, in the, the, select, in the drop down uh, list. So this was the, this, this was the, what the whole issue suggested. And then, uh, of course, um, People started working uh, working on it. Um, there, the, there was a discussion about what what to do exactly and how. And then, at one point, yeah. So Rachel uh, Rachel was working on this patch, and then she uh, changed the, the status to needs review. And then um, this guy. Uh, reviewed it and uh, Rachel uh, fixed it and whatever. Uh, so at, at this point, it was um, this was the, the, the this was the patch that when when I I first saw this issue. So this was the, the patch that that we thought was uh, supposed to to work uh, perfectly. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, actually, I, I want to encourage everyone who who is not coding or uh, to, to, to do uh, reviews because you don't need to, to write any code to do a, a good review. So let's, let's, let's review this patch. Uh, of course, if, you, if, you, if you're a coder, if you know uh, code, then of course you can, you can review the code of the patch. That's, that's actually very helpful. You can, you can check if it uh, complies with the coding standards and, and you can check if the variable names are make sense and all those things, but just checking that, that the, the patch actually fixes the, the problem is, is very helpful in it on its own. So if, if that's all that you can do, that's still a, a lot. So let me show you how, how to re review uh, if a patch works or not. 
So um, we are going to use simply test me. Uh, I don't know if you know this uh, site, but actually you can. This is a uh, this is a site dedicated to to test uh, Drupal. So you don't have to um, install anything on your own machine. You can just easily uh, spin, spin up a Drupal instance and uh, and see what it does. Um, Sorry, I have to check uh, something. Uh, so I, uh, yeah. So this was uh, uh, the uh, 8.3 was in the latest development branch. So we are going to test with the the latest uh, 8.2 um, version. But of course, if you do any any like real reviews in the future, you you should always uh, do it for the uh, latest version, which is uh, um, unfortunately it's it's the bottom one, so it's not at, at the top. Uh, like I think it should be, but whatever. Um, so let's see. Um, I think it was two, two point eight, I guess. Uh, yes. Okay. Simply test me has some responsibilities, as you can see here. Um, yeah, I, I should have uh, rehearsed some jokes or something for for this. Tricks, maybe. Okay, so we are installing uh, Drupal, um, and um, okay, continue. Yeah, I. If anyone has a has a joke, um, yeah, I'm happy to play that. Okay, so this is what we have. So this is the original. Um, uh, this is how, how it was originally. So this is this is the starting point. We I just wanted to make sure that this is where we start. Then we go back to to simply test me. And actually, we um, we are going to in add this patch. So simply test me lets us add patches. Uh, so I'm going to copy the 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 link address and it here and and launch Drupal with this patch applied. And uh, so we are supposed to see that. The list is uh, the, the time zones are not like that anymore. <coughs> Any questions so far? Uh, I'm talking about reviewing co uh, reviewing uh, patches, but yes, I mean, uh, uh, half of the, the the review is just validating that actually the code works. It does what it, what it says it does. So, yeah, uh, if if you if you just if you can help just with that, that's that's a huge help because often, like, actually, I don't want to to uh, it's a spoiler, but in this occasion, I actually okay, I'm, I'm not going to. You're going uh, to tell you what 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 we're going to see, but uh, anyway, so sometimes you can find problems just by doing what I'm doing right now. Some some error messages might come out. Some maybe you will see that okay, that particular uh, thing is fixed, but another bug is introduced or or whatever. This is this is something that that you can check without uh, looking at the code and. But good question. Thanks. Okay. Come on. So here we see an error message. So this is this is actually I I did not check the code. I didn't do anything with the code. But here on this page, 
Uh, and you know, in the original uh, error message, they were talking about the the, the administrator, uh, the, the page on the administrator's interface where you you change the time zone. But actually, the first time you see this this drop down is is on this page when you install Drupal and you set up the, the time zone. So this was something that that the the original person did not think of. Uh, so when I I uh, installed uh, her patch. I, I saw that okay. There's an error message. This is this is not good. So so yeah. I actually I I, um, I copied the error here so she can take a look at it without going through the whole process herself, and and told her that it's it's not it's this this uh, it's still not ready. It's not done and set the status back to needs work because it still needed work. So yeah, it, uh, she confirmed that she didn't see that and created a new patch. And then, okay, actually I'm not going to, to um, and do, do you want to see what, what uh, okay. I mean, I, I really have no idea how, how boring it is to, to see the installation of Drupal for the, one more time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, when I, I was a kid, I invented a, a, a trick uh, with a with coin that, that you can. Uh, I, I just it was just too hard. So I even though it worked in theory, I, I never had the. The, per, um, the um, perseverance to, to practice it until I can do it perfectly. So, I'm, yeah. Thank, thank you for listening. For this lovely story. Okay. Um, so um, you're installing Drupal again. Uh, the the uh, the coin trick. Well, so it was like if you held your hand like this and you put the, the coin like here and then you, I don't know. I mean, I could I could I, theoretically I could just you know, close my hand, open it again, and the coin would would go through my fingers to the other side. Like uh, if it was not here, I just couldn't do it. So I I, I don't even want to try. It's, yeah. Is it about the coin trick? No, it's not about okay. the coin trick. Uh, <laughs> I just want to ask, like, uh, is it better to test it not on the sandbox, on simply test me and just do it on ZAMP or uh, uh, Acquia? Or? Uh, you mean, does this ha this uh, method has any disadvantage? Or benefit? Well, the benefit is it's a lot quicker. You don't have to reset everything. You can just easily go back to the to the, the front page and, and, and start from scratch. So you don't have to re-roll your changes that's I think that's a that's a good good thing that's a benefit and I actually I don't um, uh, yeah well sometimes of course you are not in in uh, your you cannot control the environment so if for example let's say the the issue you can you can uh, repro uh, pr produce this issue only on some certain um, PHP version, for example. Then here you you cannot you cannot choose uh, the PHP version, as far as I can tell, or I don't know. So there there can be things that you cannot test here. You have to install Drupal locally in order to to be able to test it. But again, so we are on this side uh, this page again, and and we can see that um, yeah, the the error is not there anymore. And actually, as far as I can tell, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Thanks. Yeah, you're. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, here we can see that. Okay, finally the issue works as as expected, and everything's fine. So yeah, I responded to her. That's awesome. Fixed it. RTBC. RTBC is a 
Actually, I still, to this day, I don't know which one is. Uh, so it says reviewed and tested by the community, but many people say that RDBC is ready to be committed. Uh, I mean, the patches, I don't know, whatever. So RTBC is the, 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 the ideal or the, the, the ultimate uh, status. Once uh, an, an issue reaches that status, then the core, uh, co um, the core maintainers know that, okay, this issue is, is actually, it's, it's done, it's good, and um, we're ready to be committed. I have a quick question. Um, how many people does it need to be set to review and test by the community? Um, there, I, I have, I'll be honest with you, I don't think there's a hard limit or the, the, the strict rule for this. In this case, I was confident enough that of my own judgment and I, I looked at the code as well and everything. So I, I thought that, that I was pretty confident that this was, was working. Uh, of course, as you can see, um, it wasn't done at the, this point because then uh, Rachel uh, raised the point of uh, in involving some um, uh, accessibility and usability maintainers. So then it, it, it went on for quite a while after, after I reviewed it. So actually it went back to needs work and whatever, but in the end it got, okay, so um, RTBC is not the ult ultimate uh, uh, status, it's uh, the closed and fixed one, but uh, that's not something that anyone from the community can just change the status to the to 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 this one. It's um, so only a few people have the the, the permissions uh, to to commit code into Drupal's uh, repository, code in Drupal's own code base. So yeah, um, I think that's it. Uh, I just wanted to add a few um, few notes. So when you when you do um, a review. Um, yeah, so what you need to review is, does, the, the, co does the, the, the patch actually solve the problem? Does it introduce any new bugs? Uh, if, it, if, the, if it changes the UI, uh, so the, the user interface in any way, is that change um, uh, consistent with the, the, the rest of the site and, and uh, so with the, the existing and established pattern? So these are the things that, that, that you have to check and uh, the way you, you respond, uh, you should always tell, uh, describe in, in details what exactly you, ha you had done. Um, what exactly you've done, so, so someone who comes up to you will know that, okay, so this is how you reproduce, for example, a, a problem. Uh, they will be able to re reproduce a problem that you see. Uh, you have to, ideally, of course, it's, it's, it's best if you can review the code as well. If you cannot review the code, it's still very good to, to add your review and, and tell people that, okay, you checked it, this is how, what you did, and it does exactly what it's supposed to do. But uh, be, uh, be uh, explicit about not checking the code. So tell people that you have not looked at the code so someone can just look at the code and see if, if everything's okay with that. And the most important is to be nice and be constructive because, because People have worked, they, they actually put their free time into these, these patches, so it's really important to, to be nice, even, even if the patch is terrible, don't tell them the patch is terrible, be constructive, tell them how to make it better. And um, yeah, and once you reviewed it, so you can uh, this change the status uh, either back to needs work, if you think that it's not done, change it to needs work. If it's done, you can change it to RTBC, but never do that uh, unless the, the code was checked as well. Or you can leave it as, as needs review uh, if you're not sure that, that you're, you're, you're qualified or, or you have the, yeah, the qualifications to, to actually make this decision. You can always just comment that, okay, I've, I've reviewed it and this is, this is what I found and just leave it in on re needs review and someone else will, will decide if it's, uh, it can be RTBC. So that's it, uh, thank you very much. Um, and if you have any questions, then I don't know if uh, we are on time. Do we have any questions? So is there any conventional, any standards for reviewing? I mean, uh, there are so many, gazillions of versions of Drupal. I mean, the 
patch might work on oh, 8.33, yeah. but yeah. maybe not on 8.4. Always, always test the patch on the latest, actually not, not, not even on any of the stable versions. Uh, the, the, the latest, uh, the current, uh, current um, release, not, no, not the current release. So the, the dev branch, yeah, that's, that's uh, what, I, what I was looking for. So the dev branch, the dev branch is, everything is merged into the dev branch. Uh, so all new code is, is added to the dev branch. And, and every, every once in a while, um, there are the rules for that. Uh, but so sometimes uh, releases uh, a certain point in time, the dev, branch will become the release. So that's, that's what, what people will start using. And, but new code will be added to the, to the dev branch all the time. And it is possible that one day when you review something, actually this is one of, uh, another reason why you, uh, that you should review uh, codes as, as, as fast as, as possible, because it's possible that, that someone cre uh, writes a patch and it works perfectly, but someone else creates other patches, those get merged first, and this, this patch does not apply anymore. This patch does not work anymore. So the person, just because it was not added to, to, to the core fast enough, has to do work on it again. So yeah, always, always the latest ver version. As I, uh, as I tried to show you, I don't know how, how, how if it was uh, easy to see or not, but in this, um, in this um, drop down, the, the bottom one is the, the later, latest dev branch. It's a uh, 8.5.x. X is is the dev. So that's that means that uh, the the final uh, number is not assigned yet. It's a uh, it's a placeholder. So yeah, always always uh, apply patches to the to the dev branch. All right. Thank you, Gergay. Thank you. Great job. Next up is Holing Poon. Holing is uh, an application developer for the New York City Public Library. And uh, she's currently and actively using PHP uh, with recent computer related adventures, including AWS's Elastic Beanstalk, CloudWatch, VPC, and Lambdas. And you can follow her on Twitter on ho at Holing Poon for updates. She's also managing our uh, Drupal NYC account as well. So I hope you welcome home. So thank you, Joe, for the intro. Not to mention this is the perfect segue from Gagera's talk because he did mention that one way to contribute back is to go to DrupalCon and go to sprints, et cetera. But that's something that I'm going to present in subsequent slides. So uh, as uh, Joe have mentioned, I work for the New York Public Library. I'm a back-end developer, uh, but uh, I'm also a DrupalCon addict <laughs> since 2015. I've been at um, Los Angeles. I've been at New Orleans for 2016. Uh, for, there was a schedule conflict for Baltimore, so I made myself an excuse to go to Vienna. <laughs> um, the, first European city ever, first European DrupalCon ever. So um, that, here, here goes nothing. So my, uh, every friend that I come, I come back from a plane and everybody was asking me anything good in Vienna. Um, <laughs> sorry, this is an inside joke. The person on the left uh, has the Twitter handle schnitzel. So he named his uh, Twitter handle after the dish that you see at the right. So one of the things that I did was I had a lot of schnitzels in Vienna. It's actually really good. It's actually a bread and fried um, veal. If you're getting the classic version, there are also more modern versions in involving chicken and pork, which are all equally good, so uh, a lot of them. Um, Vienna is also known for um, classical music, so I went out there and looked at as many statues and memorials um, as I can with uh, for Beethoven and uh, Mozart, uh, and also incredible interiors. The one, the slide, the picture on the right. Can you? Do you guys want to take a guess of what the interior is? Like, do you, what do you think this place is? No, it is not. <laughs> I'm here to throw you off. 
No, but <laughs> that's not a hotel either. Um, to, this is a tribute to my old job at Another Life. This is the Natural History Museum at Vienna. So that, uh, that was my previous organization, and I couldn't pass the opportunity to go in, and these are the things that I see. That's just the hallway. That's not even the exhibitions and, and the things that they offer. Um, if you guys want to actually get the full experience of what I saw in Vienna, my Instagram handle is the same thing, Holling Poon, and I don't think it's private, so you guys can go in and take a look, but that's what Vienna looks like. It's beautiful. There, there is a lot more stories to tell about Vienna, but uh, I will gladly tell you at our after party over beer, again, beer, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but I'm here today to talk about DrupalCon. So does anybody want to take a guess where I'm at at this picture? Uh, yeah, you guys, I'm too easy to guess. That was me not knowing <laughs> where to look at the camera, so it looks like I'm looking downward instead of looking up. Um, but uh, can anybody guess how many people are in the picture? Wow. <laughs> but um, I would say you're pretty close. All I can tell you is that by the time we're at our closing ceremony, there are 1,670 registered attendees for this DrupalCon. So I'm pretty sure that's like a good chunk of them. 957 sounds pretty good. <laughs> So, uh, but here I'm just bring like this is the point I'm trying to bring up. It's a, it's still a pretty big DrupalCon. Um, it's a pretty good size. Um, not uh, not as big as American Con, but this is probably one of the highest number of attendees um, attending the European version of DrupalCon. Um, so okay, I'm at DrupalCon. People that will my coworkers ask me what happened at DrupalCon. Um, to, today's a special day. It's not just that it, because we're at our meetup. Uh, we, we meet here every first Wednesday of the month uh, here at 30 Rock. Can anybody take a guess what is today for Drupal? Birthday. Another birthday? <laughs> it's not Jesus' birthday, right? No. no yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, Jeff was right. Today is the launch of um, 8.4. I am very psyched. There are a lot of um, good features coming through. Uh, this is my favorite piece of news that comes out of DrupalCon. Uh, it comes out today, but it does mean a few things when we have 8.4. So for starters, uh, every uh, uh, dot release, it's, uh, it's called a minor release, it's done on a six month cycle. So we hit another six month release cycle, which is good. This is something that has been done consistently for Drupal 8. It also means that it's using Symphony uh, Components 3.2, and that has been happening since 8.4 Alpha. Uh, for reference, um, Drupal 8.3 uses Symphony Components 2.8, and that dominoed into, it works for Drush 9, which is going to be released soon. It's still in beta right now, it's in beta 5, um, which was released yesterday because I was cramming a little bit more last night, checking through all the versions. So I just found out that um, Moshe re uh, released the code like 28 minutes after I, before I checked through like to see when the release was, which was great, like that people are cranking up. And it also works with uh, Drupal console since um, 1.00 release Canada 26, and the current version right now is 1.0.2. Um, the reason why I'm throwing many, so many version numbers out there is because there are, given that Symphony 2 and Symphony 3 have, a, have very different uh, components and have slightly different functionality, it's that there's some backward compatibility things that are still being ironed out. So if you are using 8.4, um, make sure that Drupal console is the, the uh, release candidate 26 and to go for, <coughs> excuse me, um, down, download the latest version of Drush 9. So that's uh, my takeaway with Drupal 8.4. So um, what else is in the Dries note? Dries talked about a lot of things. He talked about the growth and change in Drupal, for example. Um, there's a 22% increase in the number of issues fixed and closed on Drupal.org for the year 2016 to 2017. 
Um, it's two times increase of stable projects over the last year, which includes um, panels, commerce, um, search API, um, chaos tools, token, um, path auto. Um, they all have become stable since um, DrupalCon Baltimore a few months back. Um, he also uh, brought out that there's a chart in his, uh, uh, in his presentation, which I'm not gonna bring up. Please go see Dries Note. You really, really don't wanna miss it because he, he is a, he, he's a very compelling speaker. Um, he also brought up what is the percentage of conversion right now for people um, migrating to Drupal 8. And he brought out that 30% of businesses who took Drupal business survey for 2017 uses only Drupal 8. So these, the 30% of all of these people now only uses Drupal 8, but that also points to that the rest of the crowd is either still in Drupal 7 or in some um, combination of Drupal 7 and 8. So uh, he was um, talking about like getting companies to use or upgrade to Drupal 8 and about the difficulties. And on that line of thought, he made a few recommendations. So here's one of the screenshots that I took from the uh, Dries note. Um, he was talking about like um, making um, Drupal more flexible. So uh, he would recommend it to invest more time in the headless uh, Drupal API first approach. Uh, that comes from the year over year growth of headless CMSs at 500%. It, it, is, it is something that is taking off, it's growing fast, and um, it, it, is, it only makes sense for Drupal to adopt this approach to make sure that it's API first so that you can welcome any JavaScript framework. We don't need to talk about which JavaScript framework to use. Um, people can pick and choose on their own. But on that note, the second recommendation is that you, we want to improve the um, admin UIs with a, using a modern JavaScript library. It, it, that's an interesting thought. Um, there's a difference between the administrative front end and the front end front end. Front end front end is the uh, user facing and what people see. But um, Drupal, if, if you guys have downloaded even the latest copy and look at the default admin UI theme, it's seven. And seven is something that got carried over from Drupal 7 and it has been the, the layout, the functionality is seven or eight years old. So it is time that the um, admin UI needs some TLC and he is making a recommendation to uh, have a JavaScript library to improve the admin UI. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up later on because that's another piece of news that came out of DrupalCon after he made the recommendation. The third recommendation is um, again from the thought of like um, the admin UI needs an update. Um, he was also thinking about how about just start with something small with like one or two um, functionalities in the, in the in admin UI and then just improving it like progressively. Um, this, this is again to address how old and how, uh, how much TLC it needs for this um, seven theme. Um, another thing that uh, he brought up was talking about how hard it is to update Drupal because um, there, there's still a huge investment in uh, a lot of um, human resources in order to bring Drupal to like the next version, especially like migrating from version 7 to 8. Um, there, we're about 12 critical issues away from making sure that the entire functionality of migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 works, um, which should be done soon. But um, he was also talking about, um, let's think about auto updates. And he was also saying that we're not going to do all of this today, like just a click of a button, you just auto update or just auto update everything. He was thinking about um, the auto updates for core security updates, which makes sense. You, you don't want to have um, another Drupal get in. Um, number two, um, maybe security updates for core and contrib modules. Um, in phase three, you may auto update for patches. And then in phase four, you have auto updates for minor releases. So um, what came out is two proposed initiatives. Um, DrupalCon, uh, ever since I started attending, has always had these new proposed initiatives to uh, work on a particular piece of the Drupal ecosystem. So out of um, Vienna, the, these are the two proposed initiatives, the JavaScript library, which is the first three recommendations, uh, in particular recommendation number two, and auto updates, which was the, uh, the thing that I present to you at the last slide. 
um, it has been very successful. Um, we have work pool initiative. Um, lots, lots of stuff came out from it, and it, it's very promising. There's a lot of progress. There's also the media initiative, which also um, came up with lots of features. So I have a good faith that these two initiatives will also bring us um, a, a lot of um, good things coming through in Drupal 8. And for JavaScript library, um, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the Drupal issue queue. There's already a recommendation of React.js as the JavaScript library to improve the admin UI. So stay tuned and watch that space. Um, highlights. Well, believe me, I try to cram as much Drupal con as I can in my brain. Honestly, I'm still digesting and absorbing, um, figuring out what the information means for um, me and my company. Um, so in reality, this section, name highlights is, is the sessions that I attended and what I thought of it. Um, by no means, it's not the entire DrupalCon. I'm very sure if anybody else is doing this presentation, like Neil, maybe, um, it would have been a very different experience. So um, here we go. So uh, one of the um, presentations that I find to be very important for me was the um, admin theming and design for a modern Drupal 8 from, uh, by Morton Birch. Um, Morton Birch, the first time I met him in Los Angeles, he completely blew my mind with the idea of Twig. Um, it, it's all, I, I find it almost unimaginable to get out of PHP template. I thought that was it until he showed me Twig. And the, which is why when a new Drupal kind comes in, he's a presenter, I'm always interested in what he's coming up with this, uh, the, like at this Drupal con. And this time, um, he, from the uh, three uh, recommendations about the admin UI needing some TLC, Morton for the last year has been working full time developing a new admin UI he called 11, as in turning it up to 11, so you see those dials there. Uh, he, um, basically, it's not only that he's introducing a theme, but he um, introduced it with the problems of like, what are the design problems in the past? Uh, please go check it out. He has some, uh, lots of those best practices and he has lots of comments about um, what what is uh, like, it's not necessarily wrong, but why the ad, uh, admin UI right now is so outdated and why it needs to be a completely new theme. Um, why the current Drupal uh, 8 admin theme is not enough to bring out the best in Drupal 8. And this is the new theme that he proposed. So his talk on 11, uh, a must watch. I highly recommend it. Um, this is one of, uh, I, I would say this is one of the most important talk that I've ever attended for my career, not just DrupalCon. Uh, I have recently acquired passion for accessibility on websites and I, I believe every dev should see this talk. It is called uh, JavaScript and Accessibility, Don't Blame the Language. And the presenter is um, Everett Zufel. He's an expert on evaluating how um, accessible websites are. And he gives recommendations. Um, his, com uh, his company, um, My Planet, it's a Canadian company. So um, do, do check him out. He has all the uh, best practices. I think one of the highlights that really hits me is that one way we've been approaching um, accessibility is to turn off JavaScript because uh, turning a, a JavaScript is causing problems in accessibility. And he has a completely opposite opinion and he spends 45 minutes telling you that why JavaScript is not the reason that the sites are not accessible. So uh, please go check it out. I know Morton is not the star of the show. I, I took this picture because of the sessions that he recommended. I, I did end up, um, uh, traditionally, I've been only sitting down listening to people talk. The sessions, like having a lot of people just sitting across the room listening to one person talk. Uh, but I, I broke out my mold a little bit for this DrupalCon. I went in and uh, went to BOPS. Uh, for, for those of you who are new to the concept of DrupalCon, BOPS stands for Birds of a Feather Session. And it's a smaller group of people. Uh, people get a chance to talk. As a, we form circles about 10 to 12 people in a group. Um, we talked about specific issues, like the, these ones that are being listed. Um, there's one dedicated to the 11 theme because the talk, it's 
talking about best practices and barely brushed through what the 11 theme is about, so there's a bob after that. And uh, there was also uh, bobs about redesigning the admin UI as an extension because um, may maybe the 11 theme may not cover all the ground and um, there are people putting heads together to see what happens if we start from scratch, what can we come up with, or what what's good and what needs to be kept. So there are two bobs to plan it out. And not only that, they extend it into a Friday sprint, which I also joined them. Um, as, as you cannot tell right now, my new obsession with DrupalCon accessibility, accessibility and admin UI. So uh, th this is a uh, very, um, so the important things that came out from the bobs is that the 11 theme has its own Slack channel on Drupal stack that Gagar was showing. So if you join um, Drupal's um, Slack and go to the 11 channel, there's going to be a round table tomorrow at uh, 20 hundred hours um, Central European time, which means it's only three o'clock in the afternoon for New York. So if you're, if you're free, there's going to be a line of messages coming through at that time. Um, join us, uh, we'll talk about like what's going on, um, where are we going with the 11 theme. And I think the attempt is to meet every two weeks, but this is the very first round table. So uh, let's do it. Wow, I already talked about the slides, so we'll go to the next one. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, there were sprints. Um, the, the picture, the people that are closest in the front, um, those are everybody at the um, redesign admin UI um, sprint. Uh, we were uh, not necessarily, there were no issue, we just created a new issue in Drupal.org, so uh, do check it out. I'm going to include it as a list of uh, references uh, at, at the end of this presentation. But uh, we basically fleshed out uh, what um, needs to happen for admin UI, um, what, what are the things that has not been working, etc. It was very, very beneficial. I have a confession to make, as I already told you, I am a back-end developer, so I know next to nothing about UI or front-end development, and basically I've been just sitting there and listening in and taking it all in. So for for the, uh, for um, sprints, I just want you guys to know you don't need to know everything or even anything to join a sprint. The idea is that if you want to learn, if you want to start somewhere, if you want to get your foot in the door, sprinting is probably the best approach to get in in any part of the ecosystem in Drupal. So if you have a chance, it doesn't even have to be DrupalCon, as Gary Garrett mentioned, we have uh, dev days, we have uh, global sprint days, we, we, we have uh, a, a lot of different times where we would just set up sprints, it could be done online, we do it in person, you name it. So um, please come to the sprints, because that's definitely a foot in the door, if you want to know what Drupal is, if you want to just learn something particular about Drupal. So um, another piece of news that came out from DrupalCon, every single time on um, the closing session, we would announce when the next DrupalCon is. We all know when the next North American Con is. It has been advertised and it's going to be in Nashville for 2018, for, for April 9th to 13th. For the European Con, um, the European, uh, our European counterparts are taking a break from uh, European DrupalCon. Um, there are various reasons for that. I will gladly um, tell, tell you guys about it at the after party as a long story. But that also um, means that there are pe people forming committees trying to figure out and plan out the next step for a Drupal event um, that, that's going to be in Europe. It just doesn't have the brand uh, called uh, DrupalCon Europe. Um, but it's going to happen, it's in the works, uh, so watch that space. There, there are um, issues, there are tickets, there, there will be announcements, excuse me, um, so stay tuned. Um, meanwhile, um, attend Drupal Camps, sprint, um, join us. Um, that, and that's my message from DrupalCon. Um, here are the uh, list of references and resources, uh, and what do you think? Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Beautiful, thank you very much.
introduce myself. I'm Joe. <laughs> so, for our next talk, we have uh, Joe Bachana, uh, who is the founder and president of DPCI, an implementation consulting firm founded in 1999 that focuses on the content technology needs of, uh, of a variety of organizations. DPCI and Joe have been implementing Drupal solutions integrated with um, digital access management technology since 2007, and before the DP, that DPCI has implemented digital access management platforms since the company's inception. Please uh, have warm welcome to Joe. Does this go up higher? No. Uh, a little bit more about me. First, I was a grade school AV guy. How many people here were, was, were the grade school AV person? Just a few. I thought it would be everybody in the room. Just going for, it was the best way to get out of class was to just roll that trolley uh, along to the different classes. But the other thing is I've been a performer since junior high. I'm taking a, a cue from... Um, Jake from last uh, month, and I want to just show you something very much, very quickly. I don't know if the, you'll hear the audio on this, but just 30 seconds. Fifteen more seconds. That's it. You can see the rest of it another time. <laughs> I don't normally show those kinds of things, but you know what I'd rather be doing. Uh, although I like, I'm, I'm happy to be here too. So uh, real quick, I've been in, in tech since 83, not including high school jobs. Yes, I've been around a long time. My first jobs were at ad agencies, and I actually got a chance to work at the New York Times and the Associated Press in their tech divisions many, many moons ago before starting working at tech agencies. I implemented my first digital asset management system in 1997. It was called Frisia. It was a French uh, company. It was uh, IP, TCP IP communication. was really the first of its kind. And then I founded DPCI in 1999. And we're basically a multi-channel technology implementer. So we're implementing Drupal. Uh, and we've been implementing Drupal for 10 years with integrated with digital asset management systems. That's kind of our thing. So our, our focus today is going to be what is DAM, or digital asset management, and how it's used, uh, some challenges and changes in the landscape, open source DAM alternatives, specifically those that work well with Drupal, uh, and then, of course, DAM and Drupal. So a couple of things. Uh, this is a pretty wordy uh, definition I came up with. There's probably a 1,000 definitions on the web for that. But, uh, you know, I could read it out loud to you, but you probably have already read it. But it's a business practice of codifying usage rules naming conventions, descriptive properties, and procedures for the creation, enrichment, management, and delivery of digital assets. And so if you think about a digital asset, is any file that has intrinsic value. If you've, got, if you've created it and it costs time or money to make it, it has value that you want to be able to protect. I have a quick uh, story of a company that I did a digital asset management system for that the reason why they um, acted upon it was they had CDs by a window uh, at 100 Broadway, uh, and the window was left open, and when Superstorm Sandy came, uh, those CDs blew out the window. And they had model shots, like photo shoots on them, and they, you know, we kept, they kept saying they were gonna back them up and get a plan, and they never got that plan. That's just one example. Uh, so here's some examples of assets uh, that you guys might be familiar with. They're, uh, some of them are far beyond what uh, we would expect just in our, our digital world. Um, you know, the other question is, are scanned documents digital assets? Yes, but typically those projects fall in a domain uh, which is records management or document management systems. Very similar technologies, but they're a whole different set of, uh, you know, kind of business practices and, and functionalities that go into those. Um, same thing with text files. You can manage text files, and they often are managed particularly in publishing environments where they're managing Word documents or even XML or in-copy files. So in that case, they're, uh, they want to do full text indexing of that content. And that's, that's appropriate in a digital asset management system. Some common use cases. The simplest is archive and storage. That's the one that probably 90% of the people in the room know about. Um, 
in service to other platforms like web content management. We're going to get into that in a little bit. That's pretty crucial, but that's actually been around for 20 years. That's a category. There was technology back in the early 2000s called ECM, or Enterprise Content Management, which called for a web content management system integrated with a dam and a bunch of other different uh, technologies. And so this, was, this has been around for a very long time. And the fact that we haven't necessarily officially done it in the Drupal environment yet is surprising, although we, we at DPCI have been doing that for, for a lot of years. But also dam integrated with e-commerce. Uh, solutions or multi-channel, being able to take co content and deliver it up for print on demand, whether it's catalogs or direct mail or even, you know, magazines. We did a project many years for, ago for Congressional Quarterly where they were making the, um, you know, the Capitol Hill uh, publications and it was all done template driven. So driving it from a database to, uh, you know, at that time it was, uh, believe it or not, Quark Express pages. Uh, commercial presentation, uh, or asset sales, you know, the simple thing of going into like a Getty or Corbis and being able to buy assets. Uh, CRM works in progress. We're an ad agency, might have to go through processes to uh, put things through from, uh, you know, a, a digital camera shot all the way through to, uh, to production in an ad or something. But can anybody think of any other use cases? So some common functionality. And these are where we get into the standards or norm, norms of digital asset management systems. Not every company needs these, but these are the ones that we look for. Uh, archive and storage, batching, import, and upload or update. To be able to not have to take an asset and one by one put them in, but be able to put them in an aggregate. Uh, you know, it could be done through some sort of an interface or it could be done through some sort of offloaded process, a drop folder, if you will. But this is a crucial functionality. You know, you can also think about this in the context of what we've done in Drupal uh, with regard to media. You could sort of compare in your minds and say, well, we want to, do you want to keep working on media or do we really want to start thinking about maybe doing a best of breed and integration and standardizing on a, a dam uh, interaction? A library management motif has been crucial in, in the digital asset management world, which is to say to be able to check out an asset. And when it's checked out, the source or the original asset is locked on the server, so nobody else can necessarily edit it. They might be able to use it or consume it, provided that there's rules on it. Uh, to be able to check uh, a version of that asset in um, and basically do it, I would almost say actually a revision trail, so that you have uh, an editorial queue. You might decide to branch that asset and create a rendition, but again, always keeping the relationships to the assets is, is critical, and many, many dams fail on this uh, capability, which is shocking to me. Uh, rendition management I just went over is the notion of taking a, a set or collection of assets that are interrelated, uh, they're from the same shot, but you've created some kind of a rendition for some other purpose uh, that's different from a, a version where you may have cropped it or turned it into some different asset. Um, but they share not only what the image is, but also the metadata properties um, in that. So configurable permissions, that goes without saying. Uh, some sort of a, a faceted or hierarchical or free text search paradigms. Not every digital asset management offers these. Generally, they all offer free text, but I, it always shocks me how not all dams have uh, faceted search uh, built in. So automated rendering or transcoding, typically that's done through third party integrations uh, with respect to either video or image assets. Um, available to, to, to connectors to video streaming services, uh, connectors to CDN technology, uh, that it may be implemented in the cloud. Years ago, digital asset management systems were only available on premise, to install on premise. And then about eight, nine years ago, platforms as a service started to crop up First it was Widen and Brandworks, then we came, became Binder and WebDAM. And so what happened is all of a sudden the, the DAM vendors started to say, well, now you can install our platforms out in the cloud on AWS or, or Rackspace and the like. Uh, some more functionality, customized, customizable metadata model. Uh, and so we talk about a metadata model, it's really taxonomy management. If you have a large corporation that has different ontologies or different properties. The best case is like a Hearst, where they have a woman's magazine, they have automotive titles, 
they have boating. Uh, it's a whole variety. So, so the, the controlled vocabularies around that content are completely different. It's not a one size fits all. And you don't want to have to install different dams for each one of those publications. Uh, and so this is a crucial thing. And a lot of the dams fail on this. Uh, they'll say, well, we can give you metadata, but you know, it's basically just setting up individual like terms when the, in a couple of c control vocabularies. And that may be good enough for a lot of many companies. Being able to do custom and standard namespaces. So what we try to do is look at uh, does the solution leverage EXIF or the ability to basically harvest metadata from the asset itself. Anybody's familiar with uh, EXIF or you know the XMP properties of uh, of an asset? Basically, you have if, if you're getting an asset and transporting it around. Let's say you've pulled it down from from a stock house. It already comes with with uh, credit, caption, headline information, it's already embedded with the asset. And so you can actually extend that namespace to something custom uh, based upon your metadata model. Very powerful way of porting that uh, metadata around with the asset when it's traveling through systems. Uh, ability to read write that embedded metadata as well is cr uh, crucial or integrating with the text mining technologies. That goes back to when you're taking uh, assets, let's say textual assets or, or articles, long form, where this is really popular is in organizations, either associations or uh, publishers, where they've indexed all this ancient con uh, content from 100 years ago, and they need to index it, and they need to make sets uh, from it. The UN uses uh, text mining technologies as well to, uh, to do some uh, sort of uh, not just indexing like free text, uh, like full text indexing of the content, to be able to gather meaning from that, to be able to present that out when searching. Uh, did you mean is a perfect example. Uh, delivery options, you know, the available connectors we'll get into in a bit, but connectors basically for a, a dam includes, you know, I was on the phone with a, a dam vendor today and they said they integrate with Drupal. I said, oh, okay. And I was quickly, as we were talking on the phone, I looked on D.O and I said, well, you guys don't have a module co committed to, to Drupal.org. And you well, we, we keep it ourselves. I said, well, then you're not really integrated with Drupal unless you, you put it out there. So uh, published web services kits, uh, web to print integration, again, not for everyone. But I, you know, they said print was dead 10 years ago and, and there's more print going on now and being able to connect a dam, let's say, to some kind of a database and a, like an InDesign server uh, black box engine so you could just dynamically generate content is, is, a, is a huge benefit to many organizations. Uh, Adobe Creative Cloud integration. So you could do that pretty easily now with third party tools. There's a product called uh, Silicone Connector from a company called Silicone, uh, Silicone Publishing. And what it does is it just allows you to drag and drop from a dam, from a browser, right into your InDesign page. It's a simple concept. There's a lot more integration that companies would need uh, for workflows with uh, Creative Cloud, but that's, that's a basic one that, that's very useful in, in print publishing environments. Uh, workflow, I put a big question mark on because a lot of dams don't do workflow very well. And when I say workflow, it's taking an Illustrator file or Photoshop file and being able to put it through uh, steps or statuses, routing and notifications. For me, if, I'm, if I finish, do I send it you know, over to Eric, who's going to do some work on it and edit it, or, or send comments and send it back? The dams don't do that very well. There are some new products coming out, but they're, uh, they usually would integrate with some other like uh, business processing engine that makes it really hard for creatives to work. Uh, video management, I'll, I'll kind of blow through real quick. I don't know how many folks do that, but you know, typically video m management systems are, are often different technologies than, uh, than digital asset management systems because they, they need all these different kind of capabilities in terms of uh, key, key frame display, built-in transcoding, auto transcription and indexing, you know, annotation tools, drag and drop assets, integration with nonlinear editing software. You know, people used to get Avid systems in, you know, which are very expensive. And if you look at, most people are using Adobe Premiere now that Final Cuts really kind of went by the wayside. And you don't really have this 
kind of integration with DAM and, and Premier. Uh, so. so here's some common digital asset management uh, enterprise application integration functionality. Uh, usually it's pre-integrated uh, by vendors. There's usually pre-made connectors. Uh, these are, sorry, so these are things that kind of are expected, at least for us in the Drupal community. Uh, there's not a whole lot of people in this room that would feel motivated to build a DAM connector. We at DPCI built one that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. We're thinking about building another one uh, from a product that we really like. We're only going to do it for open source DAMs. We just don't, we don't want to do them for proprietary vendors. Uh, so the challenges we see in the DAM space, uh, the proprietary products have moved very slowly. They've most of them been around since the mid-1990s early to mid-1990s, and so their progress or pace not only has been slow, but in some cases, when they rebuilt their platforms, they omitted certain capabilities because they couldn't rebuild them because they were so expensive to build. So in some cases, the dam market has um, kind of reversed or, or lost capabilities. There's been a lot of acquisitions that I'll get to in, in a second, but what's happened is companies have snapped up dam vendors to embed into their own environment, you know, their own uh, like stack. Uh, costs are all through the roof. That's why we at DPCI have done pretty well in the digital asset management project space because there's so many companies that are have bought these really expensive proprietary dams, uh, and then just the maintenance alone that they're spending could be eighty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars a year, and we can implement a, a replacement dam in open source at considerably lower than, than that, uh, you know, or at, in, at the top line, it's, it could be that expensive for the full project. So there's been quality issues as well as ongoing support issues in that category. And the biggest challenge we had, which was, again, the reason why 10, 12 years ago we came to Drupal, is the mother may I issues around extensibility. We got tired many years ago and we were working with Documentum and Vignette, we're having to beg for services, uh, you know, rather, uh, you know, calls that were basically obfuscated. And so it's the same thing in the dam environment, you know, having to pay for APIs or, or an SDK was just became unconscionable. Uh, so let me talk about some of the changes. Uh, Adobe acquired uh, Day Communique, and along with Communique came their dam. They named that AEM, Adobe, uh, that was around 2011, 2012. That was a big acquisition for Adobe that actually alienated Adobe's chain of companies that sold dams. Really uh, alienated quite a number of them. North Plains, which was the maker of Telescope, which was one of the earliest dams from 92, 93, ultimately got invested or acquired by XLKKR in 2013. Um, OpenText uh, bought several dam products. Corbis Emotion was a... Um, a, uh, a SAT, one of the early SaaS-based solutions was actually a .NET. It was actually a, uh, what was before .NET? It was AS, classic ASP, and then they had pieces of it that were ASP.NET, like integrated. But uh, uh, Hewlett Packard had bought Interwoven, which had pro, uh, back seven years prior had bought MediaBin. Again, all rolled up into these products of Interwoven team site and live site, then rolled into HP's full stack. You know, for those of you who know OpenText is they have a massive stack of technology. So these pieces have just gotten tucked in and nearly neglected. Uh, smaller players like Media Beacon, uh, which was, if anybody knows that product, that was really a, a, a novel idea that the guy who had invented it, Jason Bright, had started with the notion of enriching the assets of uh, XMP. Just any asset, you can enrich the embedded metadata so it could be portable and people could work on it right within the Finder in Mac. Uh, they got acquired, and so we'll see what happens with them over the next year or two. Chuck Walla just got acquired. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is, is the, the platform as a service solutions, which were fairly immature a few years back, are now becoming uh, preeminent. They're, they're starting to uh, really gain uh, supremacy in the market for folks that want to just very quickly roll up uh, archival uh, and, you know, just to be able to present assets out or potentially to, to connect to a, a web CMS. So, you know, there's only a few small players left in this market. Uh, 
question really in my mind is, is can they, can they you know, survive? You've got uh, Cumulus, Canto, it's been around for 25 years, German company, pretty steady, it's a pretty inexpensive product, pretty reliable, and it's pretty ex inexpensive. As its competitor is Extensive Portfolio, Extensis Portfolio and Portfolio Server, also been around for years, very lightweight product. Another one, uh, Equilibrium Media Rich, you know, uh, they're, they're pretty horizontal in the sense that they can, they meet the needs of a lot of different markets. Uh, it's not like it's a vertical market like pharmaceutical or financial. If you need a dam to house your assets, they're really looking to, to be a catch-all for everyone. They're small, so they don't have a lot of development resources. You know, the real question is some of the original, uh, the founders and the, you know, kind of the, 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 the bright light in the room has left most of these companies, so they don't have that same spirit of, uh, of ingenuity like they had. Uh, support services are always a problem with these smaller companies. The implementation services, some of them work through a channel, some of them try to do it themselves. Uh, governance, I think, in terms of like uh, basically just controlling releases and, uh, and managing things like uh, regression, you know, testing and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, in all of these cases, they have aging platforms that, that you know, kind of have to get more modernized. And it's very expensive to do so. Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit in the damn market, in proprietary world, it looks like it's pretty much vanished. And so, where do we come in? Open source. So 15 years ago, if anybody was in, was anybody doing CMS project 15 years ago? Was anybody out of high school 15 years ago? Uh, people were scoffing. I remember being in me meetings where people were laughing about CMS uh, projects. And back then, we were still doing proprietary software projects, but we started to do custom PHP projects. And we were, we were doing them, we were working them, and we got in over our heads because we were building them for everybody. But, um, you know, open source is obviously winning against a lot of the, w, the, the web content management platforms. There's still some that are winning out there like Sitecore and AEM, but a lot of that, there's a lot of factors that are outside of this presentation as to why that's happening. But, you know, Projects like Drupal or WordPress are winning in the, uh, you know, around the world. We actually run into hurdles, but we're getting, we're really doing well. And so we're nine years into an open source dam cycle. Similar thing where people were, were kind of laughing about it three, four, five years ago. People still scoff about it in the proprietary world, but I wrote this article back in 2008. And again, I'll send this presentation to anybody who wants it, but, uh, you know, what, what I was in there is saying, you know, it's, it's the same thing's happening where the dam, the dam market is going to be taken over by open source. And so they're definitely encroaching on a work group as well as dam as a media service type projects. And so here's some examples of some open source dam projects. Intermedia. I'm also going to list what their, uh, their technologies are and what their licensing scheme is because that's really important. Uh, Rizuna is another one. It's cold fusion based. Intermedia is Java NoSQL based. Resource base is really PHP, My, MySQL, uh, and it's common implementation. DPCI, we really like this product. We've done a lot of projects with Intermedia. We've done one project for resource base. We love not only the, that project, we like the people that are behind it. And DSpace has been around for a long time too, uh, and that's been a very heavily used in the library space. I don't know if that's used at New York Public Library at all, but there was one more, Fedora Commons, that was pretty popular. That's the one that's being used. Uh, so here, here, these are their relationships with Drupal. So DSpace is uh, still in D7. It's still in beta. It's stuck in beta, and there's nobody touching it. But there are 2,570 downloads. There's 91 sites reporting usage of it. So it's possible if you're a D7 user and if you're a library and they seem to have uh, functionality that's aligned with library kind of uh, use cases, it might be one worth looking at. Intermedia, the Enbridge module, DPCI built, it's D7 and D8. We've got 8,000 downloads now, 138 sites reporting usage. Uh, so we contributed, it's up on, uh, you know, people could download it, you don't have to even talk to us about it. I think we've done, of those 138 sites, maybe we've done 10 
or 13 of those projects, uh, maybe more, I don't know, but not, not 138. A few others, Razuna, uh, they only have a D7 module. There's five sites reporting usage with about 700 downloads. And then Resource Space at Fedora Commons. Resource Space is minimally maintained in D7. Fedora Commons is at end of life. There's basically nobody uh, touching that. So from a standpoint of integration between Drupal and uh, Fedora co co uh, Commons, it's, it's dead. Now Resource Space, we at DPCI are thinking about building a Drupal connector. We're thinking about doing the same thing we did with Intermedia with, uh, for the Enbridge module. We're thinking about doing the same thing for Resource Space. Uh, we don't have any customers for it, but it's just because we like that product so much, we're, we're looking at maybe investing our own sweat equity in it. And, you know, we're talking about it internally. And hopefully that'll be a 2018 project at our company. So some examples of some uh, open source DAM implementations. Uh, you'd be shocked. I don't know, maybe you, you guys wouldn't be because I, I stand in a room of people who are like from a proprietary software environment and they see this and they're just shocked that, that like regular corporations are using open source to, to manage their, their DAM archives. But WGBH, which has always been very progressive uh, and willing to be involved in innovation is doing it. Robert, the library, UVA, Cornell, that's Fedora. ESPN Marketing Services, Oxfam and Blue Cross are doing resource space. We did the ESPN project. You know, it was a really great uh, project. We enjoyed it. Uh, for DSpace, we weren't involved in any of these, but uh, Johns Hopkins, Duke, Drexel, Smithsonian's using DSpace too. Uh, for Razuna, there's Greenpeace, Bosch, uh, Association of American Railroads. And then for Intermedia, I've got two bullets for that. With these projects we did, uh, PR Newswire and American Lawyer are non-Drupal projects. Although PR Newswire was interesting because they used it as a repository to connect to their own in-house built content management systems and applications. So that was a fascinating view of them building all that capability uh, internally. And then as far as Intermedia with Drupal, a couple of examples are the UN, their news division, Island Air, Opposing Views, which is a news site, uh, University of Michigan, Flint. Uh, you know, maybe DNA Info is using a little bit of the, uh, from uh, an ancient uh, implementation of uh, Intermedia and the Enbridge module. So that's still maybe in practice. So reasons to integrate DAM with Drupal. These are, these are my opinions, so you may not, don't have to agree with me. But I don't think Drupal does a good, it doesn't manage media neutral assets. If you want to manage an InDesign file along with a Photoshop native file, a PSD or an Illustrator file, you can't do it in Drupal using media. It just it doesn't work. If you want to be able to render assets and present it to Drupal from your DAM, that's where you want to integrate DAM with Drupal. Uh, the other thing is asset conversion. You know, I know we have, uh, you can just offload that to a DAM server and you know, create these different Im image conversions based upon where you need them on your site or where you need them in a print environment. And it's just, that's what, that's what a DAM server is built to do. Uh, Drupal doesn't really address digital rights management or EXIF integration as well as DAM systems. You know, that's something we could do in the Drupal environment if we wanted to, but we've been so successful integrating DAM with Drupal in doing this that we just, we see no need to go down that rabbit hole uh, with media to offer this. Uh, bulk, bulk upload and processing of assets, we've done that in Drupal as well, but again, a great use case for DAM. Uh, DAM workflows, rendition management, usage management, all within, um, all, all done best outside of Drupal. So here are the challenges with open source DAM. Very small community of contributors. Generally, the project leads are heads of the company that offer the commercial support. So sometimes it's a one, two, three person shop. They seem to be shocked that a company like mine exists because we're just an implementation company. We're not, we didn't, we don't make the open source DAM, but we're happy to help contribute to what they're doing. And it's, we're very rare. There's not a lot of companies like ours focused on that kind of, uh, bi those business challenges. Um, the open source CMS projects are trying to tackle DAM themselves. For example, media, I think we're just trying to do too much and I think it's, it's soaking up resources in the Drupal community. Uh, there's business questions around licensing of the solutions. A uh, couple more points about this. 
is uh, there's more, more emphasis. This is common in a lot of open source projects. Is uh, emphasis on application development as opposed to integration expertise, you know, or just ease of how to configure the, the solutions. Um, the other thing is is that a lot of dam the users of dam open source dam companies are are not on par with OS. Like you know, a lot of well, not necessarily, but the culture we're trying to create in the Drupal community is if, if you're a company and you use Drupal, you have an obligation to contribute. And that doesn't exist in the damn world. They're, they're not contributing. They're just using the software and that's like it doesn't, there's no giving back. And that's a serious problem. Um, there's also been hacks and project forks. It might be similar to the way things were at Drupal at 4.7, if anybody was around back then. The people just doing whatever they wanted to do. Uh, and then loss of leadership or project lead uh, burnout. So just trying to plow through a few more slides here. We, uh, we're doing okay on time. Functionality uh, is gaining and surpri surprisingly surpassing proprietary platforms. Uh, it's easier to implement open source DAM in the cloud. Uh, there's a lot more third party kind of pre-integrations coming out. Obviously, what could really shape this is if uh, more developers, people in this room, or, or you know, open source uh, contributors, get involved in an uh, in open source dam contribution. Um, I wouldn't count out the proprietary dams. The stack sales when Adobe comes in and they sell their 500 licenses of, of Creative Cloud, they also embed in licenses of Omniture. Uh, of an AEM and all these different other products, this massive stack, and it becomes an enterprise agreement. And so the, they all do it. Hewlett Packard, they, they, they sell through so that it's easier for the sales guys to come in and say, hey, you know, you already own the product. All you need to do is just buy implementation services. So it's, it's sneaky, but it's happening. Companies still want that one throat to choke. They want to be able to go back, you know, and, uh, Say well, you know, this is our one software mega company, and so they they we're buying all our assets from them. They're the ones that are going to be on the hook. Uh, there's still be an issue, might be an issue overall about dam uh, and innovation, because I, I kind of I really do think it has stalled a little bit. Um, some of the vendors are improving development, product solutions, delivery. Uh, the pre-integrated solutions are compelling. I'm almost out of battery here. So I think the question here is should Drupal be everything to everyone? You know, I, I feel like I've answered that. There, there's going to be some important news coming out in a week, actually two weeks, from Acquia with respect to DAM. And without getting into details about it, I think it will change some things in, in terms of how people perceive CMS and or Drupal and DAM. You'll make your own determinations about what that means in terms of how Dries is viewing the challenge, what they picked in terms of the solution that they're integrating with. But uh, I think it really does go back to this question about um, you know, what, what should be, we be focusing on within Drupal and if you have customers or if you're at a company that has heavy media uh, use cases, is, does it mean it's time for you to start thinking about working uh, within a damn space? And if so, would you consider working on an open source DAM project? Maybe one of the ones that I had mentioned uh, so that you're helping them instead of the proprietary vendors. That's again, just my opinion. So that's my presentation and thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Hi, what, uh, what's P-A-A-S? I am sorry. It's PaaS is like SaaS. It's platform as a service. It's like a platform is you know it, it's a it's a series of functionalities like a DAM platform uh, would be, but but presented as a service. You could still call it a SaaS based solution. They're calling them passes or platform as a service. Thank you. And the second question is, BSD is that Berkeley Unix you were talking about? BSD is your uh, what's the BSD stamp? BSD Linux, right? Ber Berkeley's BSD. Berkeley. But what does BSD stand for again? Berkeley? Yeah. Berkeley, Berkeley Software Distribution. So that is, I haven't heard of that about it in a long time, so it's not big on. Others? 
Okay. You mentioned Duke Space, you mentioned Duke, Smithsonian, and Hopkins, among others. Can you elaborate what exactly were they using Duke Space for at Duke and Johns Hopkins? Were these research projects or were they? I would, yeah, I would recommend going to the dspace.org, and I can get, I'll make the uh, presentation available with the links, but I would go to the, uh, the dspace site because actually it has published case studies on it, so it'll go into the details of each, uh, what they did for the projects. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, we have um, Aaron Bowman. He is a senior software engineer at Message Agency, a triple focus agency and B Corporation in Philadelphia. In the fall of 2013, Aaron, who is the original architect of the Salesforce suite, started to work on the first iteration of a port of the suite from D7 to D8. Dozens of meta comments, half a dozen refactors, and hundreds of hours later working in his, with his colleague Alex Rhodes at Message Agency, Salesforce 8.x.3.0 RC6 is available and picking up steam. Please welcome um, Aaron Bowen. Let me say while Aaron is setting up, for those of you that uh, waited uh, to the very end, we've got a special treat. Chris Brando has uh, cooked, baked some delicious uh, cookies that we're going to pass around while uh, Aaron is speaking. And yes, Aaron, we'll save one for you. <laughs> Don't worry. And Viennese chocolates. Oh, and you. And, and I brought some chocolate from Vienna, so. Uh. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm going to um, try and keep this quick. This is going to be a live demo of how to set up your Drupal site to integrate with Salesforce using Salesforce Suite. Um, and I'm going to skip through a lot of the niceties and, and get right into the demo. Um, so uh, let me go to present here. Forget it. Okay. Uh, I am Aaron Bauman on Drupal. Uh, I work at Message Agency. We are um, a Drupal shop. We work mostly with nonprofits, universities, foundations, uh, and we do a lot of work with Salesforce. Um, it's very popular in that space. Um, so the state of the Salesforce suite, I'm going to breeze through very quickly and get into a sort of overview for anybody who's not experienced with uh, Drupal and Salesforce, and then I'll get into the demo and follow up with some, um, you know, uh, deeper dive type stuff. So the first thing I'm gonna do, which is the only thing that sort of takes a long time, is uh, provision a new Salesforce org and set up, um, the OAuth application that we need to connect Drupal. Um, uh, and if you are familiar with Salesforce, then you've probably done this many, many times. Steal my passwords. Please. Uh, let's try that again. Okay, so the first thing I always do is switch to the Salesforce uh, classic experience because uh, my pop-up blocker doesn't like the new experience, so but that's an aside. You might have better luck. Um, so in, in setup here, the, the search menu will help you find everything you need. 
and through apps, under build create apps, you're gonna create a new connected app, uh, and I'll call this back to that in a second. I'm just breezing through this here because it takes a, up to 10 minutes to provision. So I'm creating this app, adding all the permissions so I don't have to worry about what permissions might get in my way. Um, but on your Salesforce org, you can make the permissions as granular as you want. So typically when I'm setting up an integration with Salesforce or any sort of third party system, I will provision one dedicated user to use in Drupal who is my OAuth user for Drupal. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So um, that's set up. So what is the Salesforce suite? Uh, I'm not gonna get into what is a CRM Hopefully, if you are still paying attention, then you know what a CRM is. Uh, but the Drupal Salesforce suite will connect the, your Drupal instance to Salesforce CRM using the REST API. Um, the fundamental concept is mapping uh, Drupal entities and entity fields to Salesforce tables, Salesforce records, and Salesforce fields. So uh, that'll make more sense during the demo if that doesn't make sense. And we're using those mappings in this tool to push data to Salesforce from Drupal or to pull data from Salesforce into Drupal, synchronizing uh, either one direction or both. That's a high level overview. Um, so my bio is a little bit out of date because I pushed a new RC release today. Um, hooray. Uh, uh, working in Drupal 8 is awesome, by the way. Anybody who hasn't had time to, to get into Drupal 8 from Drupal 7, do so now. Um, there's tons of cool features, hooks, events, uh, the plugin system, everything is pluggable. Uh, so, you know, we've taken the opportunity, we, we had a, a, a project with a generous budget that funded a lot of the development for Drupal 8, and uh, that included a lot of education for me, uh, which was which was fantastic, and I feel like a real software developer now, as opposed to a Drupal developer. Um, so, yeah, I'm not gonna read all the bullets here, but um, I'm gonna give a, a quick demo of, well, let me, let me flip these two, since I already started down this path. So, provision the Salesforce org, I created an OAuth app, um, and the only thing I skipped on the Drupal side was installing a new Drupal site, because it takes a little while. Um, and I have already enabled um, a handful of the Salesforce modules. So in the, in the Salesforce suite, there are uh, one, two, three, six or seven modules here. And I've enabled all of them except for the encryption encrypted client, um, so we can have a full feature demo. And I've already created the connected app here. I'm gonna go ahead and try and get authorized. Uh, and I do have a backup in case this doesn't work for whatever reason. Like that. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna switch real quick. And I went through, we can pretend that I went through the, okay, let's pretend that I went through all of that OAuth 
which I'm sure everybody is familiar with. And I logged into Salesforce, and hooray, I'm connected to Salesforce. Um, that's the hardest part. And usually, you know, this two to 10 minutes, uh, it seems like during a demo, it's always closer to 10 minutes. In practice, it's usually closer to two. Um, so, but that's how that works. So that's, that's your configuration screen. Everything else is under um, structure. So in this menu, I'm gonna set up, is where I set up my mappings. The Salesforce example module ships with a mapping thanks to config management. Uh, and I'll walk through that. So this is a very simple, very standard mapping. Um, uh, on the Drupal side, we are taking a Drupal user. On the Salesforce side, we have a Salesforce contact. So uh, for example, you know, you, as, a, as an organization, you collect donations. Your users come to your website and log in. They want to see their donation history, this sort of thing. All that data gets pumped into Salesforce. Your users in Drupal become contacts, your primary constituency unit in Salesforce. Um, maybe their donations become opportunities, um, et cetera. So Drupal on the one side, Salesforce on the other. Uh, make this a little bigger. Yes, sometimes. So, are we tracking the Salesforce ID? Uh, let me get let me get through the demo, and then I'll show you the um, I'll show you the the back end as well. Um, so, your action triggers are, you know, what action is going to invoke either pushing or pulling of data. Uh, so that's from the Drupal side, create, update, delete. Salesforce side, create, update, delete. Um, and those. I'm not going to get into these settings right now. That's, those are a little esoteric um, for a sort of overview. But there are additional settings for each of those that give you some you know, UI power to manage your business logic of your Drupal application. Um, once you have created the mapping on the properties section here, you're going to go into fields, which is where you're doing the actual email maps to email, um, name lap maps to last name. So, and this will, this will come up in the um, gotchas or pro tips section at the end here. The schema in Salesforce and Drupal don't match. Um, just, I mean, you could set up custom objects to make them match, but for example, contact email in Salesforce is not only not required, but it's not unique. Um, but last name field is required. And we don't have a last name field in, in Drupal by default. So um, there's lots of fun, fun things that you'll run into like that uh, when, you, when you get started here. So everything that you see here is um, based on a plugin system. And your field types down here are um, different kinds of uh, field plugins. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you how those work in a minute. Uh, but this is the example module that ships with Drupal. Um, let's see, maybe, maybe not this one. I may have added a couple things since I had to, I had to cheat on my database here. But um, this is this is in essence, you know, uh, what a what a mapping looks like. So you can change direction. Uh, you have all of your Salesforce fields in each of these selection lists and all of your Drupal user properties or fields on the left side. Um, so that's your mapping. That is a config entity, so that gets exported to YAML. Uh, you can move that around between sites, um, and uh, I can ship it with a module. Um, so that's sort of your top level. The next level are uh, content entities. So with this mapping, I can now go to one of my um, go to one of my users, and I have a Salesforce uh, local task now. 
this Salesforce task will show me all of the mapped, mapped object entities that join my Drupal entity to my Salesforce record. So uh, this, is, this is very close to what's actually in the database. You have, you know, Drupal is tracking your Drupal entity type and entity ID along with your Salesforce ID and using those to keep things in sync. So if the Salesforce ID doesn't exist or if this map, if mapped object doesn't exist for a Drupal entity, then your records are not synced up. Um, there's, there's a way to use uh, upsert, which is a Salesforce, um, uh, this idea of, of pushing data to Salesforce with, that, with a foreign key so that you're either updating or creating based on the existence of that foreign key in Salesforce, but um, I'm not gonna get into that just yet. Um, so, so the question is about um, a list field in Drupal and how to push that into Salesforce, because, right, because, so another schema mismatch, Salesforce has no concept of multi-valued fields. Um, there, there's a, a multi-pick list, but it, that's really just a, a delimited list that's a text field. So. For example, in Drupal we have entity reference and I could say, you know, this user belongs to these five organizations using one organization field and all of that data gets shoved into the Drupal database with, you know, deltas zero through four, right? In Salesforce you have to actually create a new table to represent that join. Um, if I had a, you know, if I had a, a user that I want to belong to multiple different campaigns, I have to create a campaign contact table to um, store all of the you know campaign and contact IDs that link those two things together. So that's a long-winded way of saying there's not really a great way to reconcile that. Um, and when you're making decisions about your Drupal architecture, you have to keep those sorts of things in mind. Um, there is a very flexible and extensible um, API for the Salesforce module that you can implement business logic that would, you know, stuff everything into one field and push it up to Salesforce or, you know, pull everything out of some custom kind of blob from Salesforce and turn it into the right sort of Drupal data. Um, so, um, I mean, again, it depends. If you're using, if you're using like the the multi-pick list field, which is the only like multi-valued field in Salesforce, then there's support there's support for that to map onto a multi-valued field, and that's the only scenario that maps a, a sort of multi-list field in Drupal to Salesforce. Um, if you're using any kind of other multi-valued field in in Drupal onto any like single value field in Salesforce, then it's either gonna be like an architecture issue where you need like multiple mappings or some kind of custom business logic um, in your event subscriber layer. Um, anything else on this chart? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the form so Back to the Salesforce mapped object, which again is the join record between Drupal and Salesforce. And it's a table because you can in theory have multiple different mappings for the same Drupal entity or the same Salesforce entity. Um, so, you know, maybe I have one that's just push, one that's just pull. Uh, maybe I have a user who has four different roles and I have different mappings for all of those roles. Um, I, in practice, it's it's going to cause problems more often than not to have multiple mappings for the same entity, but um, the the schema supports that. So 
that's why you see a table here. Um, the edit form, again, this is this is all the log this is all the data that's going into the database. Um, and the, the the key things here are your push and your pull buttons, and those will do what they sound like. So I'm gonna show um, So from, from my mapped object here, I have a link to Salesforce. I can click through that and see, here it is. Um, I'm going to change the last name. This should be a simple one, hopefully. Um, change it to a new Drupal username. And I'm gonna save that. And from the edit form here in Drupal, I'm gonna hit pull and of course not. Um, let's try that again. A new Drupal username, um, and I'll show you push. You know, should work the same way. Um, for that, I'm going to go to my Drupal user account, edit that to back to the old name. Uh, this is a throwaway example, but that's the that's the general concept. Um, so um, this can get very complicated very quickly, um, and I will I would say you know as much as there's a UI and as much as there you know you can download install this module and. and and go to town, I, I don't, I mean, we don't, for the projects that we build, we don't let our administrators have access to uh, the Salesforce mappings, for example. Um, they're, they're, I don't think we've ever uh, deployed uh, an app, a Drupal application where there wasn't some layer of custom business logic on the Drupal side, either you know, to manipulate data coming from Salesforce or to manipulate data before we send it to Salesforce. Um, you know, so, so it's meant to be very extensible. The downside of that means you don't get a ton of stuff out of the box. Uh, I mean, you get, you get the basics. You get enough to build this mapping and get you started, but you're likely gonna need to implement at the very minimum an event subscriber, um, which is the, for people coming from Drupal 7 world are hooks, are the old, the old hook system. Um, and everything in, maybe I can change this. Everything in, all of the API in Salesforce module is now event subscribers, so there's no more hooks. Um, if anybody used the old, um, the Drupal 7 version of the module, there is a, um, no. Let's see, oops. Oh, okay, good. There is a Salesforce API at PHP that will that has all of the old hooks. These don't work anymore. Uh, but they'll, they'll, um, there's sort of a wayfinder for people who are updating. For people who are new to Drupal 8, did ne never look at this file. Um, because 
or people who are new to Drupal in Drupal 8, or people who, who don't have all the Drupal 7 baggage, this will just be confusing. Um, so there is a Salesforce example module which has a working uh, event subscriber uh, that you saw um, this message here comes from our example event subscriber. Um, and there was there's a similar message on poll. So the event subscriber works. Um, the first thing you have to do is set it up as a service. Uh, you can call it anything you want, but it has to have this event subscriber tag. And you're, you know, then pointed to your class, which is typically named something like, you know, so-and-so subscriber. Um, in your event subscriber, you have to implement this get subscribed events method, uh, which is part of the event subscriber interface. And this is what maps uh, events that come out of your um, the core dispatching event dispatching system to your class here. So whenever Salesforce push module pushes an entity to Salesforce, it dispatches this Salesforce push allowed event and I'm subscribing, I'm subscribing this push allowed method to that event. So whenever a push happens, or this actually happens right before a push happens, this push allowed method of the class that I'm in is going to, um, is going to get called. So the, the two examples that we saw were uh, push success, and we saw push fail as well. Um, and those are very simple um, push fail example, push fail, fail success. So in, in these methods is where your, your custom business logic is gonna, is gonna go. So this push params method especially will let you manipulate the packet that gets pushed up to Salesforce. So push params is just, is your, your git bot, your HTTP, you know, request body, essentially, that gets, that has all of the actual data. Um, and why don't I uh, turn on develop module and show you exactly what that looks like. Uh, does anybody have any questions before I do that? Here's my here's my packet. You can see this is these are all the fields um, that are getting sent up to Salesforce and the values of those fields. So I could add a field here. Uh, I could change you know manipulate that however I want. Um, you can do so. Uh, very extensible. Um, five minutes. Great. Um, there's a consolidated. Logging module, you want to turn that on while you're while you're building. Uh, that's the Salesforce logger. Um, and in terms of actually like running a Salesforce Drupal project, like environment management um, is is one of the tricky things. So you'll end up with a bunch of these sandbox developer orgs in Salesforce. Um, the mapped objects are content because they're not portable. Your Salesforce IDs in Salesforce don't transfer between environments, and that includes things like record types um, that you know maybe you would think of as config in Drupal. Anything that has an ID in Salesforce is specific to that Salesforce sandbox, um, unless you have a full Salesforce sandbox, but those are expensive, so most people don't. Um, there's, there are new Drush commands for Drupal 8 modules, so you can do things, um, you can do, you know, you can do basic uh, queries, SOQL, that's Salesforce's query language. You can, you know, interact with the metadata, you can, you can push, you can pull, uh, you can, you have different kind of queue operations, which I didn't even talk about, uh, the whole asynchronous um, system that's, that's built in. Um, uh, what else? 
pro tips, uh, version control. So Salesforce, everything is uh, exportable. Anything that you build in Salesforce, including uh, your custom objects, adding fields, um, Apex code, all of that you can you can get out you know, using something like the my force.com migration tool. There's APIs for it if you want to roll your own or find a different one. And you can stick all that in version control. Um, so do that. Uh, you know, we have a, a couple different packages that we install in Salesforce to make our, our Drupal integrations easier. Um, and I recently discovered Environment Hub, which is like a Salesforce org in which the sales in which the records are other Salesforce orgs. So, you know, if you're a large enterprise, you can you can do cool stuff with that. If you're uh, uh, a dev shop like us, you can manage your clients' Salesforce orgs from one org. Um, so that's cool. Um, so uh, I'll end there. If, in case there's any more questions. I did have a question around um, ma managing a, a, a dupe issue. So if you have a contact, let's say, if, if you're syncing instead of just always driving one way, how do you protect mm -hmm. if you don't have, you know, last name isn't really going to be useful. Email could be much better, but how do you protect? It's uh, a it's a definitely a tricky problem. Um, and I have seen I have seen CRMs that try to solve it with like you know building out this UI where you can impl you can build a sort of matching rule based on, you know, and assign weights to different fields and how they match. So, I mean, honestly, like this, this module, we sort of throw up our hands and implement that business logic in the plugin layer, the event subscriber layer, wherever we need to. We try to use upsert wherever we can. So, you know, if we can rely on email as unique, uh, we'll add a, we'll use that. Um, if we have a, a foreign key that's guaranteed unique across environments, we use that. Uh, so I have a project where I'm using UUID um, as the as the sort of master. Um, but yeah, it's 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 tricky. I mean, and like you know, Salesforce is free for nonprofits, uh, as in you know, free as in kittens. Like there's a there's they're gonna have you're gonna have administrative overhead, and duplicate management. Is, is one of those things. Salesforce has apps that are very good at identifying duplicates and give you a UI to, to merge them or to, you know, to prevent them from happening. Um, so that's generally where we sort of offload that. And then the follow-on question, which I think I sort of know how you would do in Drupal, is when people change companies, they might change their email, they'll change their company. But so you have to have your entities or your, your um, company content also uh, sync with Salesforce as well. So you're kind of making the connection both within Drupal as well as Salesforce? Yeah, you're right. So, I mean, that's tricky too. If you want to expose, right, that uh, a hierarchical relationship, you need all of that, you need all of that data, right? If you're going to expose to the to your user in Drupal some way to select from all the existing companies in your database to assign themselves a different company, you have to, you have to make that available in Drupal. Uh, you know, so you'll need at least two mappings for that. Um, but that's tricky too. Uh, <coughs> how can you sync the uh, contact? Okay, the contact has multiple uh, field. How can you sync to the Drupal user the multiple role? So you need to use the, that pool, pool parameter order, right? Um, so d what's specifically about contact? Uh, like a contact has the multiple fields. Yeah. Uh, I want to push these multiple fields to the Drupal user multiple role. Um, so you can, um, you can add as many fields as you want on this, um, on the, to the mapping. So right now I just have, you know, email, last name, leads. If I want to add another field that maps first name to, you know, to another field, I can do that. Um, if you want to, if you want to, again, if you want to like take one field from Salesforce and map that to several different fields in Drupal, that would, yeah, that would be in your subscriber, your sort of plugin alter layer. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Erin, are you going to stay a little bit after this? I can stay a little bit. I have a, I have a 10 o'clock
train, but I can, I can, we can chat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so real quick, we're uh, go to the fa Bill's Bar and Burgers at 16 West 51st. If anybody wants to get uh, some drinks, sponsored by uh, Fastly. Thank you, Fastly. Thank you, Fastly. We don't have to go home, but we cannot stay here. Please go to Bill's Bar and Burger. I think I finally got over my nerves. Now I have to figure out how to.